Right, so I'll just do some quick introductions. Um, anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Jo Chamberlain. I'm the Heritage and Participation Officer for the Atkinson and Southport. Um, I'm sure that if you're listening to today's talk, you know about the exhibition which we are now holding, which is I Was Born 80s. Um, and today we've got the curator of the exhibition, which is Matt Fox, who is going to be talking about the exhibition um, and about his love of collecting and some of the things that he has collected. So, um, for the duration of the talk, you are going to be on, uh, your uh, computer are going to be kept on uh, mute. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to send them through the chat option. And at the end of the talk, we will look at them and I will also do a quick shout out for the next things that's coming up at the Atkinson. So uh, that's enough of me. So um, I shall hand over to Matt Fox. Over to you, Matt. Thank you. I'm going to begin with my David Attenborough bit. Our species, Homo sapiens, has existed on planet Earth for the past 300,000 years, generation after generation of children, growing, playing, learning, trying to make sense of the world around them. And across those long millennia, change has happened at a snail's pace for Homo sapiens, a slow evolutionary grind, but no more. Like Han Solo piloting the Millennium Falcon, our species has suddenly hit hyperspace. And you and I are living through remarkable times. Each new year, brings a fresh revolution in science, technology, globalization, entertainment, and in the way we socially interact with each other, um, as we're doing today through Zoom. Um, with so much now changes in just one year for the children of today's Britain, then how much has changed in one whole generation? Um, hello, I'm Matt Fox, and I grew up during the 80s. I was born in 1972, and so I spent those formative years from age eight to 18, experiencing that decade, which I'm here to talk about today. And those like me who grew up pre-internet in the 1980s can genuinely state that life was very different then. And we can investigate that through the objects, the pastimes, the treasures that 80s kids held dear. We can consider the shared cultural experience of childhood in the 80s, as the limitations of the time also served to bond us together. Although strangers, one child of the 80s, can say to another, I know what you watched, uh, I know what you played with, I know what you read, I know you, because I experienced those things too. Now I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Um, as Joe said, this presentation acts as an accompaniment to the I Grew Up 80s exhibition at the Atkinson in Southport. You don't need to have visited that. But if this talk does inspire you to do so, then I'll mention that it's free to visit and it's on at the Atkinson until the 19th of March. So um, like Bill and Ted in their phone booth or Marty McFly in his DeLorean, let us take a most excellent adventure back in time to revisit 10 remarkable years, the greatest decade in the history of history, the 1980s. Now, after evoking uh, Back to the Future, uh, I think it's only fair that our whistle-stop tour of the 80s childhood uh, begins with the cinema. And if you were a kid in 80s Britain, then the movies you were excited to see at your local Odeon or ABC cinema all originated from one place. It wasn't France, Jean de Florette, too slow. It wasn't Italy, Cinema Paradiso, too arty. And it wasn't even Britain, a room with a view, too stiff. It was the USA and Hollywood to be precise. The top 20 hits at the UK box office during the 1980s were all US productions. The 60s and 70s had been characterized by challenging, bleak, and sometimes discomforting cinema. But the unprecedented success of Star Wars at the end of the 70s had convinced Hollywood that perhaps all the audiences actually wanted was a good time. And uh, talking of Star Wars, the black and white image top right was the Canon cinema in Sutton, Surrey, where I made my very first trip to the cinema in 1978. And the film I saw there was Star Wars. The cinema to the upper left, uh, showing Police Academy, was your cinema, and that was my other local. They were both about the same distance from my house. And the cinema in the middle, you might recognize as the classic cinema in Southport. Um, the eagle eyed might be better spot that it's showing Rocky III, uh, which dates this photo to 1982. Pessimism was shown the door and, and anything is possible optimism would carry through many of the movies of the decade. 
Films such as The Karate Kid, Footloose and Dirty Dancing delivered a triumphal message to the youth of the day that if you tried hard, you could succeed against the odds. They also leaned heavily on music. This was the decade of MTV and the music video and the soundtrack album for Dirty Dancing sold an incredible 3 million copies in the UK alone. Another recurring theme that defined the cinematic decade could be described as fantastical suburbia. An ordinary American suburb in which extraordinary events occur and it's up to the kids to fix things. And this can be seen in films like Gremlins, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Goonies, The Lost Boys, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And it's also the theme behind the decade's biggest box office hit, Steven Spielberg's E.T., The Extraterrestrial, in 1982. The beautiful poster art for E.T. is by John Albin, and it recreates Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Uh, it also crucially preserves the mystery of what E.T. looked like. John Alvin was one of many artists who made their living painting movie posters. And um, at the end of the 80s, the introduction of Photoshop resulted in the era of hand-painted movie posters disappearing almost overnight, and those who painted them having to find alternate work. One poster artist who wasn't going to go quietly was Adrian Perkis. He did the movie poster for 1983's Trading Places, which was the breakout hit for Eddie Murphy. Uh, who would go on to be one of the decade's biggest stars with the likes of Beverly Hills Cop and Coming to America. Um, Perkis sneaked his signature into the poster art, making it appear as graffiti on the bathroom wall. Another artist I must mention is local lad Josh Kirby from Merseyside. Kirby painted Return of the Jedi's movie poster for the British campaign in 1983. And uh, here we see the three metre sized banner uh, of Kirby's art being hung at the Atkinson in the exhibition back in 2016. Harrison Ford was obviously one of the stars of Return of the Jedi, and of course he also made three Indiana Jones movies throughout the 80s. This movie poster was painted by Richard Amsall and captures a really wonderful likeness of the actor. Um, another artist, Mike Salisbury, designed the now iconic title font, uh, which perfectly encapsulates the movie's sense of adventure. Indiana Jones, um, and in fact many of the movies featured in I Grew Up 80s, are still going strong today. Uh, new Indiana Jones has been filming in the UK this year. I believe Terminator is up to five sequels now and counting. And a new Ghostbusters movie is playing at the cinemas as I speak. Um, you know, these sequels may not all be good films, but it's a testament to 80s movies that their cultural impact um, is still being felt today. And cinemas weren't the only source of movies for an 80s child. There was also the video shop. A child of today, used to pressing one button to watch a streaming movie, may not appreciate the lengths their 80s counterpart had to go through. First, cycle or beggar lift uh, several miles to your local video shop, then peruse the shelves and often discover with disappointment that the movie you wanted is already vented out, resulting in the difficult decision to uh, travel on to the next closest video shop or accept a second choice. Finally, after choosing a film and paying the high fee, you race home and try to watch it as many times as possible to get your money's worth. And then inevitably forget to return it the next day and end up paying a fine. You could also record films off the TV, uh, but as thrilling a prospect as this appeared, it was let down by most of the movies shown on TV being quite old, playback quality on the tapes being poor, a constant fiddling with the tracking to make the picture steady. Obviously, you also needed one of these, and this is actually a Betamax video recorder. And back in the 80s, there was a product war between VHS and Betamax, uh, neither of which had tapes that were compatible with the other. This Betamax player um, cost around £750 to buy at the time. And if we adjust that for infl inflation today's money, that's about £3,000. The majority of households couldn't afford uh, video recorders and opted to rent them instead. And the high street chain uh, rent radio rentals had over 500 stores around the country um, at their peak. Uh, I, I might also add that if you had bought a Betamax, it would have been an expensive mistake as VHS ultimately won out and became the industry standard and Betamax faded into obscurity. Um, moving on from movies, there was always the option of a good book instead. The 1980s was an exciting time in literature for children. The country was moving away from the twee and cosy tales such as Rupert the Bear and Famous Five and towards something rather spikier and more eccentric. 
Uh, Douglas Adams and Terry Pratchett were bringing a Python-esque British sense of humour to the previously po-faced genres of sci-fi and fantasy with the restaurant at the end of the universe and the colour of magic. Sue Townsend uh, truthfully and hilariously presented the worldview of a 13-year-old British boy in The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole. Choose your own adventure books such as The Warlock of Firetop Mountain enabled young readers to actually participate in the story with their decisions determining what would happen next. And in the same year as the uh, Snowman cartoon aired, illustrator Raymond Briggs released When the Wind Blows in 1982, a bittersweet tale of a loving elderly couple after a nuclear attack on Britain. And American author Stephen King was prolific and popular throughout the decade, with many of his books being made into movies, uh, including Christine in 1983, and his stories of small town horror uh, later influencing the likes of TV shows Stranger Things, as we see today. Um, 80s kids also enjoyed comics and magazines. Uh, there was the Beano with its anarchic cast of characters who got up to all manner of politically incorrect pranks, uh, dishonesty, bullying, truancy. Um, they had great success with its fan club, uh, achieving one million members in 1988. 2000 AD, starring the ultra-fascist uh, lawman Judge Dredd, who was judge, jury and executioner of criminals in Mega City One, launched in 1977 and achieved peak readership of 250,000 in 1988. Storyteller magazine ran from 1982 to 85 and is fondly remembered for artfully presenting classic fairy stories aided by a talking book cassette. Jackie for Girls, which featured photo stories, typically about boyfriends, was the lead teen magazine at the start of the decade, but it was overtaken in the mid 80s by newcomer Just 17, which was achieving incredible UK sales 500,000 copies per week. And Smash Hits, featuring interviews, features and song lyrics, uh, it was actually one of the only ways to discover our song lyrics prior to the internet, launched in 1978, uh, but achieved peak popularity in the late 80s with a million selling issue in 1989. All these successful publications were British made and they helped give readers common ground and a shared cultural identity. Um, since the rise of the internet in the 90s, Kids' publications have been in decline and readerships are now a fraction of their 80s heyday. For young people at this time, another thing that we bonded over was the singles chart. This was a significant playground topic and thanks to Top of the Pops, which aired every Thursday evening to an audience of 15 million, the youth were well informed and knowledgeable of each week's movers and shakers. High street shops such as Woolworths and Our Price also devoted considerable display space to the singles chart uh, with records clearly laid in chart order. Indeed, the 1980s was a period in which British music achieved a level of worldwide success that it hadn't since the height of the Beatles. This was a combination of old talent and new. A number of veteran artists uh, successfully transitioned to the synth rock sound. Uh, Queen and David Bowie, as you see here, also the likes of Genesis, Elton John, Paul McCartney, in some cases having their greatest commercial success in the 80s. Whilst a host of new British acts broke through, whilst a host of new British acts broke through uh, with spectacular sales on the international stage, and these included Duran Duran, who are actually still going strong today. Uh, the Rio album cover, painted by artist Patrick Nagel, has to rank as one of the most iconic covers of all time. The Police, led by frontman Sting, uh, who you could say were the Coldplay of their day, uh, they were described in 1983 by Rolling Stone magazine as the biggest band in the world. Another new act was the Eurythmics with lead singer Annie Lennox, who provided an image of female power on 1983's Touch album cover with her dramatic orange crew cut and black mask. And George Michael, who dominated the UK charts with his pop group Wham! and then went on to become a global megastar when he went solo with his Faith album. And there was Southport-born singer Mark Armand, who had a string of hits in the early 80s, most notably Tainted Love, which not only sold over a million copies in the UK, but spent a then record-breaking 43 weeks in the US Top 100. The advent of MTV and the new importance of music videos to provoke record sales were a boon, as the UK had a strong tradition of technical excellence in film production, and also plenty of acts enjoyed dressing up for the cameras, Adam and the Ants, Culture Club, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, and the Thompson Twins, as we see here, 
to name but a few. As successful as our homegrown music was, the 80s music scene wasn't all about Britain, and I have to mention the big three American stars. Michael Jackson, who delivered a blistering dance routine with a phalanx of zombies in the 14-minute music video Thriller, uh, which is frequently named as the greatest music video of all time. Uh, Madonna, who wasn't just a music icon, but also a fashion icon and star of the movie Desperately Seeking Susan. And the incredibly prolific Prince, who racked up 20 top 40 hits in the UK charts throughout the 1980s. Let's also take a look at how we listen to music in the 80s. This is the mighty Casio KX101 stereo from 1984, which earns the title King of the Boomboxes with 131 individual buttons and dials, including its own keyboard. This eight kilogram example of AC success is very different to Alexa and the minimalist speaker dock systems of today. This next music player needs little introduction, the Sony Walkman. It was the original personal stereo of the 80s and so definitive that the multitude of rival products were often nicknamed Walkmans too. As the first personal tech that you carried on your person, it laid the groundwork and prepared the market for the smartphones that we carry today. Let's move now from music to fashion. For girls, the 1980s were a fantastic period of feminine empowerment, and so many of the fashion trends emphasized strength and vitality. From shoulder pads and bat wings to big hair and bright colors, 80s girls dared to be bold. Our mannequin here is modeling jelly shoes, which were low cost, colorful PV sandals uh, that proved popular casual wear for 80s girls. Leg warmers and leggings were a fashion fad in the early 80s, driven by movies like Fame and Flashdance, and also by the mass popularity of aerobics at that time. Uh, Jane Fonda's workout video sold over 1 million copies of, <coughs> in 1982. Um, the model also wears a rah rah skirt and combined dancewear tutus with a miniskirt of the 60s to create a new fashion trend that was widely worn. <clears throat> Fingerless gloves and wrist bangles were also popular accessories at the height of the decade. Uh, both lace and leather gloves were sported by trendsetters uh, such as Madonna, Cindy Lauper, Billy Idol, and Aha. Bat wings, sleeves, and shoulder pads helped define the 80s look, and the phrase power dressing was coined to describe it. Geometric shapes and vivid prints were also popular. For boys, branded clothing from Italian sportswear fashion makers were highly desired. Uh, the brands with the most street cred being Fila, LS, Diodora, Kappa, and Sergio Ticini. And I'm proudly wearing my LS top here today. Um, you'll also see the male mannequin wearing a shell suit uh, jacket, uh, which I'm not going to wear. Uh, perhaps the most maligned fashion trend of the decade. Uh, lurid, affordable, zip-fronted tracksuits with vivid geometric patterns and a shiny nylon sheen. Um, it's also interesting to note that in the 1990s, the fashion world's response to the 80s was really deterred in the opposite direction uh, with minimalism and grunge. But today, however, I'm glad to see 80s fashion is enjoying something of a revival. There are a couple more fashion niches I'd like to show you. Sneaker fashion, uh, trainers to us, arrived from the US in the 1980s and swiftly became the single most important clothing item for playground credibility. High tops as worn by Michael Jordan and wrapped about by Run DMC were what everyone wanted. Sadly, Dunlop Green Flash is what most of us got. 80s youth uh, didn't have smartphones and in many regards, the wristwatch filled that role. They were a status symbol that made you feel grown up and important. <clears throat> you see the calculator watch there, which enjoyed peak popularity in this decade and swatches were also popular. Uh, the name swatch or the word swatch uh, stands for second watch as they were intended to be a cheap disposable companion to a traditional Swiss watch. And this made them perfect for young teenagers and many are now considered pop art design classics. School bags uh, were another fashion accessory of some sort. Uh, the satchels and backpacks of the 70s were out and unnecessarily large sports bags were in for 80s kids. Ed's iconic and very exotic sounding Monte Carlo bag uh, was way bigger than any kid needed. <laughs> but on the smaller scale, the bum bag enjoyed an unlikely moment of popularity also with 80s youth culture. And here's something that you might have found within the school bag. 
Um, uniforms and textbooks may have been dictated by the school rules, but uh, pencil cases proved 80s pupils with some leeway to show off. Um, this now iconic example by a British stationer's Helix uh, proved particularly popular. And one of the most pervasive school fads in the 80s uh, was collecting rubbers. Manufacturers obliged by creating ever more colourful, novelty shaped, smelly scented designs for kids to uh, fill their pencil cases with. You'd also, of course, need some money for the canteen or tuck shop. And here's some currency. We have the half penny coin used to buy sweets. Uh, that was withdrawn in 1984. And the one pound note that left us in 1988 after the one pound coin had come out in 1983. Um, the silver coins were also reduced in size during the 90s. And the BT phone card became part of 80s life in 1981. Uh, the ceramic pig you see was called Baby Woody. And uh, Baby Woody was a free gift when you opened the NatWest Young Savers account. The promotion proved extremely popular with an estimated 5 million uh, ceramic pigs given out. And some girls and boys toiletries. The body shop became a high street staple in the 1980s. After opening her first store in 1976, British entrepreneur Anita Roddick expanded right across the country. And um, Roddick also helped raise public awareness uh, to stop animal testing within the cosmetics industry. The uh, popular cosmetic brands for boys in the 1980s were rather more uh, budget conscious with hindsight insignias, packaging design and description as an all over body program does make it rather appear like a product to wax your car with. Now, if you didn't live through the 80s, then you probably no idea what this odd gadget is. Um, it's called a dyno label maker, and you'd buy them in shops like WH Smith's and John Menzies. You turn the dial to choose your letter, then squeeze it to imprint it on the embossing tape. Um, it was used to make labels for mixtapes, computer games, blank videos, lunch boxes, and anything else an 80s child might want to personalise. Now, there are two more areas of my collection that I want to show you, um, food and toys. Uh, now, let's start with food. For a collector, you'd be surprised how hard it is to find food items from the 80s. At the time, chocolate bars like these were ubiquitous, produced in their thousands, if not millions, but no one kept them. Uh, you may or may not recognise the chocolates here. Uh, peanut treats at the back, were discontinued in 1988 and in the early 90s Marathon was rebranded as Snickers and Opal Fruits became Starburst. Uh, 54321 with this catchy advert jingle. 54321. Uh, that was a real 80s chocolate bar as it never left the decade. Uh, released at the start of the decade and discontinued in 1989. Uh, these three I describe as lunchbox bars. And you'd be quite jealous if one of the kids at your school pulled one of these out in the canteen. And again, they were well marketed to kids with memorable catchphrases. Um, 80s kids didn't have memes. Uh, this was about the closest we got. Don't take away my breakaway. I want a trio and I want one now. And if you like a lot of chocolate in your biscuit, join our club. And breakfast cereals were also fiercely marketed at children in the 80s um, in a way that they simply aren't today. Um, they often had colouring images or transfers on the back of the box as an activity and a free gift inside the box that had kids sticking their arm in the cereal and having a good rummage around. Of course, times change and things that were acceptable in the 80s might not be now. Um, every newsagent and sweet shop in the country sold sweet cigarettes and top deck shandy. So six year olds would be enjoying a pretend puff on their cigarettes whilst parents looked lovingly on, and uh, children drank Top Deck, uh, which did contain 2% contain, uh, alcohol. So beer and fags for kids, great stuff. And back in the 80s, you could smoke uh, in McDonald's uh, and most other places, uh, but McDonald's was the most child-friendly restaurant in the country. So you'd be there for some kids' party uh, and their mum and dad are smoking Benson and Hedges at the table whilst you're trying to enjoy your Big Mac. And here we have some 80s drinks. Um, before it was a uh, Mexican beer or indeed a global pandemic, Corona was British Busy Pop, uh, which came in some unusual flavors like dandelion and burdock that you see here. In an early example of recycling, kids could also return 
a glass bottle to earn some extra pennies. There's the wonderfully colourful Quattro can and uh, Lucasade, which despite containing more sugar than Coca-Cola, um, was marketed as a medicinal drink in the 1980s. If you were feeling poorly and kept home from school, a glass of Lucasade on the bedside table was often one of the perks. And uh, you can make your own drinks with Soda Stream. This was a must-have kitchen fad in the 80s, an amazing 40% of British households um, got busy with the fizzy and owned a soda stream. After dipping in popularity in intervening years, soda stream has recently made a bit of a comeback uh, for fizzy water. And as for Mr. Frosty, uh, well, a slush puppy maker in your own home was every kid's dream. Um, but in reality, Mr. Frosty's ice grinder really didn't work very well and took ages to make a drink. Now, um, I think I've saved the best or last, so let's now talk about the good stuff, 80s toys. And um, we have to begin talking about toys with the Rubik's Cube. Uh, and I believe on Saturday, there's actually gonna be a Rubik's Cube competition held at Atkinson. So if anybody fancies their chances, then do uh, investigate that on the Atkinson's website. Now, if you were looking for one single iconic object to sum up the decade, then you'd have to choose this one. During the height of the Rubik's Cube craze from 1980 to 83, an estimated 200 million cubes were sold. They were invented by a Hungarian named Erno Rubik. And you can tell from the little sticker on, on the center top in this image, that this one is a genuine cube, uh, but millions and millions of bootlegs and unlicensed versions flooded the market too. After the phenomenal success of the cube, Erno Rubik followed it up with the Rubik snake, and several other variations on the theme. Unlike the cube, the snake is not a solvable puzzle, but a, a tool to create shapes. For example, a little doggy, as you see here. Another colorful icon of the decade was Simon. This was an electronic memory game where the colored buttons flash and the player must remember an ever increasing sequence. And this was the era of electronic games, the 80s. So uh, let's take a look at a couple more. The iconic Speak and Spell uh, with membrane buttons came to the UK in 1980 and was an instant hit with both parents and children. Um, it was an educational tool, so the parents loved it, but also a cool electronic game. And it even appeared in the hit movie E.T. Nintendo produced uh, Game & Watch titles from 1980 to 1989, the three small ones you see at the front. Um, each was just a single game and relatively low cost. The British company Grandstand also had some success with handheld versions of popular arcade titles, Scramble and Space Invaders. This one is not so much a toy, um, but the VL Tone was a big seller in the UK. It was a miniature digital synthesizer and even kids like myself with absolutely zero musical talent wanted one, um, mainly thanks to its funky rhythm presets, which uh, made it look like you were playing something really good. However, if there was one electronic 80s toy that I desired above all others, it was Big Track. This futuristic rover could be programmed to drive around independently and fire its laser with a sequence of up to 16 commands. The retail price of $39.95, about £150 in today's money, Big Track was an expensive and aspirational toy for an 80s child. I had one at the top of my Christmas list back then, but I never got it. However, I've got one now. Take that, Santa. Whilst we're on the subject of electronic entertainment, I must also mention the good old ZX Spectrum. Arriving in 1982, the quirky ZX Spectrum was the most successful of the microcomputers created by electronics entrepreneur, Sir Clive Sinclair. It sold over 5 million units and inspired a whole generation of British kids to try their hands at coding on its squidgy rubber keyboard. Many of the early computer games released for the ZX Spectrum didn't fall within established genres, with titles like Jet Set Willy, Ant Attack, and Saber Wolf, seemingly designed within an atmosphere of unbridled creative freedom. However, if you really wanted to bring the amusement arcade into your home in the 80s, then the Atari VCS console was the one for you. With 30 million consoles sold worldwide, the Atari VCS could be considered the foundation from which today's entire video games industry was built. It remains a design classic with rubber-clad joysticks, red fire buttons, and the iconic walnut trim. 
although the cartridges were not cheap, around 25 pounds for new titles, which makes them about 100 quid each, adjusted for inflation today. Not everything had to be electronic though, and in 1982, Leicestershire-based toy company Palatoy updated their successful Girls World makeup bust with the Super version, which allowed girls to practice makeup and styling techniques with an 80s twist. There was also Cindy, the British rival to Barbie. Cindy was designed to be the regular girl next door, um, in contrast to Barbie's sort of supermodel looks. And this ice skater outfit proved very popular following the gold medal Olympic success of Torville and Dean in 1984. My Little Pony was one of the first toy lines to foster a collect them all mentality with a steady release of subtly different figurines with names like Sunbeam, Posey and Applejack, resulting in 150 million ponies sold during the 1980s. The Care Bears were also a bona fide merchandising phenomenon in the 80s, encompassing movies, TVs, books, games, toys and more, exceeding $2 billion in revenue over the decade. Smurf figurines attained peak popularity in the 1980s thanks to an accompanying cartoon series which launched in 1981. The figure in the centre of this image is Praying Smurfette, released exclusively for Christmas 1985 and never reissued, and Praying Smurfette remains the rarest of all Smurf figures. And then there were Cabbage Patch Kids, which had one of the most successful launches in toy industry history. Three million Cabbage Patch Kids were adopted in 1983. In the US, stock shortages famously resulted in Cabbage Patch riots as customers turned violent at a number of stores, a bit of a precursor to Black Friday sales where we see idiots fighting over products in the shop aisles. Another massive hit was He-Man, Masters of the Universe. The 1980s boom in fantasy films packed with muscular heroes and a symbiotic relationship with a cartoon series helped drive the phenomenal success, and He-Man peaked with toy sales of 400 million in 1985, exceeding even Barbie. Thundercats and She-Ra also ploughed a similar furrow. Whilst on the subject of fantasy, I have to mention Dungeons and Dragons, to which I lost many happy hours as a teenager. It's a role-playing game in which one player acts as a dungeon master who describes the environment and dangers whilst the others assume the role of a party of adventurers. Many sided dice are used to decide the outcomes. Space toys were also big in the 80s. Lego has remained an evergreen toy across the decades, but the 1980s is best remembered for Lego space. These sets evoked an industrious lunar base with minifigure astronauts who wore removable helmets and, and uh, backpacks. Uh, not to be outdone, Playmobil also jumped on the space bandwagon. The spacesuits are reminiscent of those seen in the movie 2001. The Zoids, a race of mechanical beasts led by the mighty Zoidzilla. Zoids toys were bolstered in the UK by a weekly comic and a computer game by British company Martech. And in 1981, Britain's Detail, who were toy soldier specialists, moved on from World War II knights and cowboys to create a space themed line with the backstory of Star Guards versus Aliens. The most enduring of the 80s space toys has to be Transformers, Robots in Disguise. This toy line pitched the heroic Autobots. Uh, displayed here, you can see Optimus Prime and Bumblebee against the evil Decepticons, there's Megatron. And 80s era toys are now known as Gen 1 and are highly collectible. And the Transformers franchise continues to this day. Now I'm going to finish up by showing you my two favourite items in the exhibition, my BMX bikes. Uh, Rally released its first BMX, the Rally Burner, in 1982. Although BMX biking was new to the UK, Rally was a trusted household name with a solid reputation and the Burner proved a huge hit, helped fortuitously by the box office smash ET, the extraterrestrial, that same year, which prominently featured BMX bikes in it. Rally increased their initial range from five up to 15 models in 1983. And by 1984, they declared sales of 500,000 burners. It was the most successful BMX ever. The team burner you can see here is the bike on the left. The bike on the right is a Rally Vectar from 1985. Now the Vectar appears like a mashup 
between a BMX and a ZX Spectrum, a bike with an onboard computer and styled with the sort of retro futuristic look that could only have come from 80s design. Riding the zeitgeist to popular TV shows, Knight Rider, Airwolf and Street Hawk, the red LED control panels allow kids to check their speed, distance and duration, listen to the radio and unleash a flurry of arcade style sound effects as they cruise along. However, weighing almost 20 kilograms, most children would have struggled to uh, pedal their Vectar up even the gentlest slope. This bike of the future also retailed at the astronomical price of 300 pounds, equivalent to 900 today, as Rally attempts to recoup the uh, half of a million they'd spent developing it. Uh, the Vectar draws some parallels with the Sinclair C5, an electric vehicle for adults uh, also released in 1985. And similarly, it didn't catch on with the public. Indeed, few Vectars have survived the day. In the past few years, um, the popularity of Garmin bike computers has shown that perhaps the Vectar wasn't such a crazy idea after all, just too far ahead of its time. And um, I think that's a good note to end on. The 80s was ahead of its time in many ways. And as a child, you felt that sense of acceleration and excitement all around you. Um, I hope that my little talk today has conveyed something of that excitement. And thank you for taking that trip back to the future with me. Oh, thanks, Matt. Um, that was wonderful. Um, I have to say, uh, I mean, and I'm not on my own saying this, the whole thing with the 80s, uh, you got me thinking about sort of why I was so fond of it. And I suddenly realised that beginning of the 80s, I was sort of of an age where I wanted to go out, but wasn't old enough to get in pubs and things. So the early 80s was the cinema, because um, that's where, you know, me and my best friend could go like every week and see the new film that would come out. And we did. Um, and the mid 80s was when we were old enough to actually start going into nightclubs. So that's when the music kicked in. So it's like all the major things that happened to you sort of as you're growing up um, was the 80s, which made it, you know, amazing. So um, I am just going to quickly uh, do a couple of shout outs. If anybody has any questions, comments, things you want to share with us, please do so now. Just send it in by the chat option, which is at the bottom of your screen. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, I'm also going to say that one of the things we've got run into a company Matt's exhibition is we're asking for any embarrassing photos of you during the 80s. So if you have any sort of amazing passion for pars or anything, we would love to see them. Um, we are currently doing an online exhibition, what you can see on our websites, but also we're sharing all these on social media. So that's that's been a really fun one to do. And thank you, Matt, as you kindly said, we do have a Rubik's Cube competition on Saturday afternoon. Um, you don't have to be a professional. Um, we're going to do different stages, different levels. So, you know, part of the competition might be just who can do one side quickest. It's just a bit of fun. Um, but there is a £50 voucher involved for the winner. So if you're interested, it's between one and three this Saturday. So the next talks we've got coming up is 5th of January is another online talk. Um, and this one is Western Approaches HQ and it's Liverpool's best kept secret. So this is going to be an online talk by uh, Dave Roberts who's from Big Heritage over at Western Approaches, and he's going to be talking about the history of Western Approaches and doing a little bit of a guided tour uh, for anybody who's interested in that. The 12th of January, um, we're back in house with our talks. So uh, that will actually be in our studio at the Atkinson. Um, and this one is Love and Betrayal, um, and it's called Writing Poland During the War. Um, it's going to be an author called Caroline Kirby, who has recently had a novel published called When We Fall, um, which is about a Polish Sherman. And she's actually going to be coming in talking about the research that she did um, to actually put the book together. Um, so let's have a look. Have we got any? Oh, here we go. Um, so the first one I've got is uh, Rachel Zaskias actually asking uh, Prince or Michael Jackson. So I'm guessing she's saying, you know, who, who's the better out of the two? So what do you reckon? Well, I'm going to say, for, for me personally, I'm going to say Prince. I think he had um, a little bit more depth, a little bit more um, artistic uh, noose. He played all his own. Actually, well, Michael Jackson was pretty great as well. It, it is a, it's, it's, it's battle of the heavyweights, but uh, uh, for, for me, Prince just edges it. Okay. And then Laura B has said Duran Duran. So this could, this could start a while, this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, personally, I was at Adam and the Ants. I fell in love with Adam Ant for a brief period of time. So that was a whole other episode. Um, oh, yes, this one's, yeah. Um, 
Spencer, um, a very enjoyable and informative talk, but I felt that the exhibition should have had something special on Mark Almond, especially as his mum works at the Art Centre, which is now the Atkinson. Um, well, um, yes, that is something that we have been talking about, um, and we do know about Mark Almond's mum. Um, dearly, dearly would love to, at some point in the future, do something of an exhibition um, relating to him. It, it's sort of if and when we could, but um, yes, he's definitely on the uh, the radar for that one. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you, Matt, is what, what would you think is your defining moment of the 80s? Well, oh, I'd, I'd have to say um, Band-Aid. I, I think oh, that, yeah. that was just one of those kind of, you know, everyone sort of remembers where they were when that was on. And, uh, you know, I didn't say that I was a bit too young to have tickets to go and see it. But um, I remember sort of sitting there pretty much all day with it with it playing on and um obviously queen again they, they rec recreated it in the recent bohemian Rhapsody film and um, i'm a big fan of queen so i i, I love that and, and it was just a sort of a collective moment where we all got together as a country to do something really good something really positive and um people power so it had to be a band-aid yeah yeah no i agree that's amazing and the other thing that i found really striking as well is it's like we, we sort of have this kind of memory of the 80s it's sort of this day glow 80s and everything was exciting and and wonderful and happy but it's sort of the backdrop there was all kinds of things going on i mean we had like the nuclear threats were going on i mean, do you remember that horrible horrible advert with the really weird music what told you what to do in the event of a nuclear attack um and like there was a minor strike so all these kind of things were going on but we've kind of like we've, we've kind of glossed over that um because we, we really did fall in love with the 1980s Yes, I mean, my, my exhibition really tries to look at it from the child's perspective, the child's eye view. And obviously, yeah. you know, a, a lot of stuff we, we, we kind of see in the media about the 80s is Margaret Thatcher and Falklands War and Miner Strike. And, you know, and these kind of like big, heavy issues. And um, I, I really wanted to, um, you know, give uh, my experience of the 80s as a, yeah. as, as a, as a, as a young kid. So um, yeah, yeah it, it, it reflects that and um, yeah, it, it's kind of more, more nostalgic and, and, and fun. I have noticed when I've been in the galleries, one of the things that I really like hearing is people are going around and there's, there's two versions of a conversation. One is they, oh, I used to have one of them and this is like a fond memory. Or the other version is I always wanted one of them. <laughs> so as you were saying with your bike at the end, um, yes. yeah, there's definitely an element of that. Um, oh, Rachel's just asked, um, what do you think of 80s uh, what do you think of 80s movie modern remakes such as Ghostbusters? Well, I haven't actually seen the Ghostbusters film yet. I'm quite keen to. Um, I, I, you know, I think quite a lot of the stuff that's sort of followed on hasn't really been as good as the, the originals um, for, for one reason or another. But I, I think sequels quite often have diminishing marginal returns. But I always feel duty bound to go and see them. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll see the new Ghostbusters film because I know it's going to be a good time. It's going to have some special effects and some laughs and things. And as long as they carry the spirit of the 80s, which really, you know, which I, I sort of talked about earlier, it really was just pure entertainment. It was cinema yeah. for entertainment. There, there weren't really many deep mes messages. Um, they, they weren't really trying to challenge you. They weren't hugely art artistically valuable, but um, they were purely entertaining. And, um, you know, I think that's actually what a lot of us really want. <laughs> we yeah. sit down at the end of a hard night and watch a movie. Yeah. Right. I think that's the end of the uh, questions. Thank you, Matt. That was absolutely joyful. I um, loved every minute of it. Thank you so much. Um, if you haven't been down this in the exhibition, um, it's currently running and it'll run through till next year, till March next year, so you've got a bit of time. Um, we are currently open Monday to Saturday, 10 till 4. Um, so if you want to come along and see it, please do. We have a, a working arcade game, so you can play Donkey Kong and Miss Pac-Man, isn't it? That's one of the other games. Uh, just bring 50p and uh, you can knock your socks off and uh, relive the 80s. So uh, thanks, Matt. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, please come along and see the exhibition and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Take care. See you soon. Bye bye.